Welcome friends, my name is Oscar Sandy. I am a clinical nutritionist in, for, in Australia and we are going to present a seminar entitled Sick Vegetarians and the Nutrient Connection. Uh, this is a seminar very near to my heart. I am a vegetarian. I have been a vegetarian for the last 16, 17 years now. Um, but I have to, to be honest with you, my main attempt through this seminar is to be as as uh, balanced as possible, okay? Now, I will say 90% of my patients are not vegetarians, okay? So I have to deal with patients that do, uh, do not eat what I eat, and it will not, they will not eat what I eat regardless. So I need to work with them. 10% perhaps of my patients are vegetarians, and some of them get referrals to me because they heard that I am a vegetarian so they feel more comfortable with me okay now I have to say that because of that 10% that 10% of vegetarians have challenged me quite a lot okay uh, there are people out there and as I said in, in some of my other seminars that they tend to cure everything with uh, charcoal and ginger as long as charcoal and ginger are around, you can, you can cure everything. And in a clinical setting, that is not the case. Uh, you realize more and more as time goes by and you start seeing more people with different cases that, um, that there is no one responding equally to the exact template, okay? If it was as easy as just having a printout template and no matter who walks through the door, I'll just give them the same. Mm. I will be making a fortune with very little work, okay? Uh, I can pretty much say that there are not one exact protocol uh, given to, to two different patients in, uh, in my practice. So with all the patients that I've seen, you cannot actually, you, you might be able to find some protocols that are 98% similar, 95% similar, but they are not one equal to another because everybody is an individual, okay? Now, these seminars are going to be uh, broken down in three presentations. So this is the first presentation. And uh, in the second presentation, we'll be talking about the, the macronutrients that, uh, that vegetarians need to be aware of. In the third presentation, we will be talking about certain cofactors and micronutrients, uh, again, that um, vegetarians need to be aware of. However, it is my conviction that the most important of the three, despite the fact that everybody wants to know what should I eat, uh, what type of nutrients should I be including in a vegetarian diet, despite the fact that that is very important and probably people will like to know that, I believe that the first one of the presentations is the most important because it actually sets the basis of our understanding of diet and what we eat, what we eat, okay? So that's why this particular one, the first one, the one that we are about to, uh, to disclose to you, it is vital. It is vital because if we understand properly this, then we will be able to manage the macronutrients and the micronutrients appropriately to benefit us. All right? So, as with all our seminars, they are designed to share available information with the general public. They are not to be used as a treatment for individual cases. I'm making an effort not to actually put uh, amounts of, especially supplements, uh, because it just depends on the people, depends on the person, okay? So I'm making an, an effort of that. Um, simply for, for a number of reasons, because uh, everybody's different, and I have to be aware of that, even with the information that I share. Uh, secondly, because it's not going to be fair for you, and it's not going to be fair for me. If it doesn't work, and I haven't been able to, know, to get to know you and consider some of the areas that are also affecting you, that might be the reason why it's not working. You feel disappointed. I feel that I haven't done my job. So in order to allow me to do my job properly, uh, you can make uh, an appointment with us. Uh, we also do international appointments through, through Skype, and we can discuss your particular case, your particular scenario, okay? So 
we're going to start with what I believe is the most important of the three presentations. Despite the fact that later we're going to talk about nutrients and their effects and where are we getting them from and what to do to get them into our bodies. This one is called vegetarians by principle or application. Okay? Who knows here what a vegetarian is? Can you raise your hand? Do you know what a vegetarian is? Okay, some do. <laughs> what about you in your house? Do you know what a vegetarian is? Now, we are going to try to disclose or try to find out what is a vegetarian, okay? Because out there is a whole lot of variables, okay? So, how many here have heard of the fructarians? Okay, the fructarians will, will eat mainly fruits of the fruit family. So, anything that is considered a fruit, for instance, an avocado is a fruit, uh, zucchini will be a fruit, uh, capsicum will be a fruit, eggplant will be a fruit. Okay, so they are actually, those that will contain seeds in themselves will be considered fruits. And also, of course, the strawberries, the apple, the kiwi, and so on. So you'll have the very sweet ones and the semi-sweet uh, fruits. You know, the, um, the cucumber will be considered a fruit in the mind of a fructarian. That's what I'm talking about. In the mind of a fructarian, a fructarian will, will have no problem eating uh, a cucumber, despite the fact that it's a fructarian. Okay? And they will all, also include some green leafies. So they will just get like very dark lettuce and, uh, and, and tender, tender leaves, okay? Spinach and things like that. That's what a fructarian will normally use, okay? And there, of course, there is a philosophy behind it. There is a, there's a way of uh, thinking behind it. Uh, they, they say well, this is actually more, uh, uh, more likely the, the food of our ancestors and it's easier to be digested and so on, okay? So that would be the fructarians. Now, do they, do they, um, will they be also considered vegetarians, yes or not? Yes. But I'm pretty sure when I ask you the question, do you know what a vegetarian is, you were not thinking about this type. Okay. Now we have a raw vegan. Do you know what a raw vegan is? They will actually eat uh, everything that is not or does not come from an animal and they will actually consume it raw. For instance, they will have raw, raw lasagna. Now, how are you going to have raw lasagna? Well, most probably they're not going to use the, uh, the, the pasta, the pasta one. They will just use like zucchini, for instance, and they will mimic that. They will use like zucchini or, or cucumber and things like that and they'll make these dishes. They will also uh, use, for instance, there's a lot of recipes in the net with raw vegan cakes. Have you seen those ones? Raw vegan cakes. So how do you make a raw vegan cake? You'll probably have like a very nut, nutty base with nuts and dates. And then you have a nice nutty filling with cashews, for instance. And then you'll have a nice nutty decoration. So, you can either call it raw vegan cake or you can just call it a nut cake, okay? <laughs> because it has a lot of nuts and coconut oil mainly. Now, it's great when you have visitors to give them that because it's so heavy to the stomach with the amount of fat that they will probably eat just a little bit, okay? So, it's good for temperance in that sense. <laughs> All right, so, when I was talking about vegetarian, if you knew what a vegetarian was, were you including this group as, as vegetarians? All right, then we have a strict vegan. Now, a strict vegan might or might not be raw, but it is a strict in the sense that honey is not allowed because it comes from where? It's the vomit of the bee, right? It doesn't sound that appetizing when you say it that way. But, uh, so they won't actually take honey and they will not actually wear leather shoes. They will not actually use leather belts because it proceeds from animals. So they will, they will not walk into your B&W if you have 
leather seats in the BMW, they will feel uncomfortable with it. That will be a very strict vegetarian from that point of view and their philosophy behind it will be very much animal activist. So they'll have a lot of um, emphasis on animal cruelty. Uh, if I have a goat and um, my, my, my hand happens to just get some of the milk from the goat, I am torturing the goat and therefore that will be wrong. So that will be the, vi the, the vision of many strict vegans from the animal cruelty point of view. Okay? Then we have a vegan. So a vegan might actually have honey, they might be wearing uh, a leather jacket and they won't see a compromise of, um, of their understanding. They'll have a more uh, health approach towards, uh, that will be the biggest emphasis. Of course, animal protection and so on, but mainly, mainly health and they will be a vegan from that point of view, just to look after their bodies and to look after their health. Okay, and they will, they will have leather shoes and this, there's not a problem in that regard because they are vegans for health reasons as a number one. Okay, you following? All right, then you have an over-vegetarian. Over so what is an over-vegetarian? Yeah, an over-vegetarian will eat eggs. Okay, now if in the majority of cases, anyone that wants to respond themselves to a vegetarian, in the majority of cases, you ought to expect a person that, is, that, that wants to look after the health uh, of his or her body. So you are uh, assuming that an ovo vegetarian will be uh, obtaining eggs from small company enterprises, and from healthy hands, and they'll, they'll be particular on that, okay? That would be what you ought to expect, at least, okay? Then you have the lacto-vegetarians. So the lacto-vegetarians will include uh, milk products. So it will be yogurts, it will be milk, it will be cheese, it will be cream. Again, from a health point of view, a lacto-vegetarian that is a lacto-vegetarian from the health point of view, you will like to think that they are trying to get good sources of milk, uh, maybe organic, uh, may, maybe organic milk, maybe uh, good sources or good ways of making yogurt. Uh, so there's minimizing the lactose and, and so on. Okay. Then you have the avalacto vegetarian, which is actually combines both. Okay. Combines both. Combines eggs and combines uh, or al allows eggs and allows dairy. Now, even within that group and the previous two ones, the lacto-vegetarian and the ovo-vegetarian, you actually have a person that will consider himself uh, an ovo-vegetarian because once every three or four months he eats an egg. And another person might consider himself an ovo-vegetarian because he eats half, an, half a dozen eggs a week. But in between them, there's a huge difference. The one that actually eats once one egg every three months and the one that is eating six eggs every week. Can you see that there's a big, big difference? Okay, so even within that, there's a huge difference. So though I'm actually trying to break it down into the different categories there, even within each category, category, category there's also quite, quite of uh, diversity. Okay, then we have, look at this one, Pescatarians. So what is a pescatarian? How many here haven't heard of a pescatarian? Okay, so pescatarian is a vegetarian that eats fish. And that's how a pescatarian will introduce himself in most cases. What are you? I am a vegetarian that eats fish. Now, automatically some people prior, prior in that list Okay, the uh, ovo-lacto vegetarian or the vegan will say, well, you are not what? You're not a vegetarian. If you are a vegetarian that eats fish, you're not a vegetarian. In some cases, what actually happens is these are vegetarians that either they are transitioning towards vegetarianism, so they're going that way to an ovo-lacto vegetarianism, or people 
that are reducing the intake of meat and they, they, they left their meat and they are eating fish and they are, they are there, they're just finding that equilibrium there, or people that actually are coming back. What do you mean, what do you mean Oscar, by coming back? They have a problem with the eggs and they have a problem with the milk, maybe not from an ethical point of view, but it doesn't sit, then will, doesn't sit well with them. Maybe they're, they're reacting to the eggs, maybe they are allergic to the milk. So they are backing back, so they don't actually have the eggs and the milk, and they gain the protein from that, that, type of, that level of, of um, complete protein, they get it from the fish, okay? Normally, in most cases, if you speak with a pescatarian, it will be a person that it is very concerned about their health. So far, the groups that we've been seeing there all will be very concerned with their health, okay? Now, then we have the white meat vegetarians. What are the white meat vegetarians? These are the ones, for instance, that you get in Spain. I was in Spain many, many years ago when uh, maybe, maybe f uh, if I've been a vegetarian for about 16, 17 years, um, maybe when I was in my third year as a vegetarian, I went to Spain with my wife and uh, the friends gathered together, we gathered together in a restaurant. And uh, in the 90s, if you were a vegetarian in Spain, you, you definitely were a very rare, rare individual. So when I disclosed to my friends that I was no longer uh, eating the same way that the Spaniards eat, but I was a vegetarian, one of my friends, which is a very funny guy, he said, can I, can I say that to the waitress when she comes, please? Please, don't say it to her. Let me say it. So sure enough, the waitress came, you know, to take the order and said, so um, what do you want, you know? And she goes through the menu, you know, she just speaks up the, the menu. And my friend said, okay, see what you got for this fellow here? He's a vegetarian, you know? And uh, and I wanted to see her reaction. And in the beginning, she was quite calm. And I, that surprised me. And she goes, all right, we've got some chicken, chickenless nishul with some salad. And I go, oh, I mean, he, he's right, I'm a vegetarian. And she goes, yeah, a chicken nishul with salad. And I said, oh, but I, I don't eat chicken. I said, why not? Well, because <laughs> it's chicken. He said, ah, ah, that kind. I said, yeah. He said, ah, I thought it was, you were the other kind. I said, well, what is the other kind? The one that doesn't eat red meat. So the one that doesn't eat red meat is a vegetarian. <laughs> Are you following? Okay. So I said, uh, no, yeah, I must be the other kind. He said, all right. Okay, so we got some, this is the fish menu. We got a number of options there. I said, uh, just don't eat fish. I, you don't eat fish. So you must be of a different kind. <laughs> and I said, oh, I just mainly eat vegetables. He said, really? I said, yep. Okay. Well, we have uh, this famous uh, dish in Spain. There's a dish with uh, green peas. And uh, it has a particular name, but it has, it's a dish with green peas. But it actually has pieces of bacon in it. So he said, oh, okay, you can have that one. I said, but isn't that the one that has bacon in it? I said, yeah. And I said, I don't need the bacon. And by that point, my friend, I mean, he was holding his tummy. He was laughing, laughing. He could not resist it, you know? Because it he, he was the show of the, of the entire uh, lunch. And um, so, and finally, she actually brought for me some uh, rice, uh, fried rice. And in the fried rice, I had to actually fish out all the prawns that they put on it. Okay, so okay, that's the best that they can get, all right? She actually had a number of different levels of vegetarianism in her mind. Now I'm going to put you one here. Meat-eating vegetarians. Now what on earth is that? Meat-eating vegetarians, they will introduce to you in this sense as a meat-eating vegetarian. Now, all of them 
are vegetarians, or all of them at least are claiming to be vegetarians, or all of them in their heads, they actually believe that they're vegetarians. So who are the meat-eating vegetarians? So the meat-eating vegetarians, they say, we are vegetarians with meat supplementation. So what does that mean? We are mainly plant-based. In fact, we are plant-based in, in, um, in the bulk of their food, but they will just have small, pe uh, small pieces of, of red meat, maybe once a week or maybe two or three times a week. Okay, so in their mind, they, are, they, they, are, they don't want to have the fish, they don't like the fish, they don't, they react to the, for instance, they might react to the eggs, they don't like the dairy, and, um, and they try legumes, but the legumes make them bloated, so they, they say, okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to be vegetarians, and maybe two or three times appointed times through the week, we're just going to have small portions of meat. And so if you, you ask him, if you ask them, what are you? They say, we are meat-eating vegetarians. So in other words, we're vegetarians with meat supplementation. Now, how confusing is that? Who is a vegetarian? Look at the list. And um, yeah, amazing. Now, if you go to the dictionary, the dictionary is not that clear anyhow either. It gets very confused. If you're traveling, for instance, through Korea Airlines and you are a vegan, there is not a vegan option in Korean Airlines for you to tick. The only option is vegetarian or lacto over lacto vegetarian. So vegan in Korea Airlines is actually vegetarian option. And if you are not vegan, so you are allowed eggs and milk, you take the lacto over lacto vegetarian. So you understand what I'm saying? So in Korea Airlines, vegetarian means not uh, eggs, not milk. Okay, so the definition also changes. If you would have actually been in Spain in the 90s, in this case with this white dress, you will think that, you will, you will see that the perception of vegetarianism in the 90s in Spain was one. But if you would have actually been in Spain in the 30s, 1930s, it would have been quite an opposite one. Because the main meal was just pork. Pork, like we call something like chorizo, we call, you know, like, like sausages, and, uh, and meat, and pork fat, and the pork lip, and the pork stomach, and everything around the pork. So if you would have actually in Spain in the 1930s show up to a lunch with a plate of salad, and like Caesar salad, have you heard of the Caesar, Caesar salad? It has bacon in it. So you put the bacon strips just like that, and the rest is a Caesar salad. Guess what would they would have called you in the 1930s in Spain? You are a vegetarian. Vegetarian has bacon in it. Yep. But what is the alternative? They would actually look at that and say, well, that's plant-based. Whatever you're eating, you're eating it in a base of vegetables. Can you see that? So it depends, depends on the context, depends on the, on the situation. In fact, let me just illustrate. In, in the 19th century, okay, this is in the 19th century in Australia, okay, this is in Australia. There is a lady from the United States of America, okay, and this lady has, is, is responsible for a huge vegetarian movement, okay, in the United States of America, in Europe, and now she's been, she's, she's been uh, sent to Australia, okay? She's very, very big on the abstinence movement. So around that time, the abstinence movement is the, the one that was uh, advertising or, or, or pushing for no alcohol, no smoke, and, um, and certain uh, drugs and so on, okay? So because of the damage that those things were doing to society and families. Well, while she, American background, but while she is in Australia, she's been in Australia for about seven years or so, a number of years, the, the head of the abstinence movement in, uh, in, uh, in Australia wanted to get to know what her group thought about abstinence. Okay, 
And this is what she wrote in the 19th century, okay? And this is what she wrote. She wrote, I am happy to assure you that as a denomination, or as a group, we are in the fullest sense total abstainers from the use of, of liquors, wine, beer, fermented cider, and also tobacco and all other narcotics. Now, when I'm putting here fermented cider, this is not apple cider. This is actually an alcoholic drink that, for instance, this is very big in Europe, it's Spain, north of Spain, is very, very big. So that thing is like wine, is like an alcoholic wine, but made out of apples. Okay, so this is not apple cider vinegar. You can drink apple cider vinegar, you won't get drunk. Okay, you start drinking that cider, we actually call it sidra which is very, in Spanish, we call it sidra, which is actually very similar. And it's an alcoholic drink that can actually reach to 14 degrees of alcohol, okay? So, when she's asked by the abstinence movement in Australia what her group thought about abstinence, she's saying, I am happy to assure you that as a, as a denomination, as a group, we are, of the, in the fullest sense, total abstainers from the use of liquor, wine, beer, a fermented cider and also tobacco and other narcotics. And then she goes on and says this. This is a 19th century, okay? She says, all of our group are what? All are vegetarians. Now notice, many abstaining wholly from the use of flesh food, while others using it only in the most moderate degree. Now, you read that statement in our context today and what do you think? That's a big oxymoron there. Why? Because if you all vegetarians all abstained from meat. True? Will you follow? Okay, so if you all vegetarians in the 21st century context, if you all vegetarians we all abstain from flesh. In the 19th century there is no contradiction. There is no oxymoron. We are all vegetarians, some eating, abstaining totally from, from meat, while others, they eat it in a moderate way. And this lady is calling vegetarians to which one of the two? To both. To both. So, what is happening here is that we need to be aware of historical context and definition because I don't know how many of you have, have been following what happens in forums out there. You know the internet forums? They can be very, very nasty. Um, there was the case of a gentleman, he was a Rodish, a Rodish, a person that eats everything raw. And he, he was like a hippie. Long beer, one of those gurus, you know, food gurus that are out there. And he, 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 they call those people uh, YouTubers, you, right? They, they have like a YouTube channel and they, they make money out of YouTube just by getting the money from advertising. So in one of the occasions, he was in a friend's farm and the friend, the friend gave him a little bit of fresh goat's milk. In front of the camera, this guy actually drank it. To cut the story short, that guy had to sell his farm and move. Do you know why? Because he had so many followers in the YouTube channel and he started receiving live threats. People wanted to kill him. How did he dare to drink the milk from the poor goat? You know? And he actually had to move and buy a place and it was undisclosed. The channel had to be shut down and because he, he, he was getting emails, he had to change all his contact details and so on. People were visiting the farm at night because he had committed the sin of drinking a little bit of goat's milk. Because he was a Rodish and he had this movement behind him and he had gone out of line. In Australia, there was known the case of a um, uh, naturopath. She has written many, many books on, uh, on vegetarianism, and, but mainly in raw veganism and veganism. And she fell pregnant. 
And when they checked the vitamin D levels, her vitamin D levels were very, very low. So she tried the vegetarian option or the, the vegan option, which is D2. So D2 supplement to bring the vitamin D levels up. But the vitamin D levels did not come up. When uh, the, the levels did not come up, she decided to move to D3. So D3 is an animal source vitamin D. Now, be aware of what I'm about to say. It's an animal source, but you don't kill the animal. What, what the vitamin D3, that, that vitamin D3 came from, came from a protein called lanonine. And lanonine is, it comes from the Latin word, and in Spanish we call it lana, which is the wool of the, of the sheep. So when they, they do the shearing of the, of the wool, the, the, the part of the wool closest to the skin holds lanonine. So they extract lanonin from there, the lamb hasn't died, they extract the lanonin from there, and then they just put it through the lab and they just uh, synthesize it into the, the active ingredient and D3. Well, this lady, in order to, she was an author, very well known in Australia and, and in Amazon.com, uh, and she, she disclosed in her website, uh, in her blog in the website, that she had taken vitamin D3. When that was announced in her website, people started saying that the best thing was to burn her books because she was a hypocrite, because she had sold something that she herself could not even keep up with, and she had committed the great sin of supplementing vitamin D3 to rise her vitamin D levels. I don't know how you call that. I call that sickening cultish approach. Uh, it is extremely dangerous and those people have found diet but they could have found Islamic State, they could have found a terrorist group, they could have found the IRA, they could have found ETA, terrorist group in Spain, whatever it was. They just happened to, found, to find diet and now they are very militant about it and if you get out of line, careful, careful. That is a total way out there uh, and is very common and is very dangerous. And we have to make sure, I believe that I have a responsibility as a practitioner to make sure that everybody is aware of what is out there, okay? So, is vegetarian a principle? Now, what is a principle? A principle is a basic truth or a general law or doctrine that is used as a basis of reasoning or a guide to action or behavior. Principles are unchanging, unvarying rules of human conduct. In other words, we do not move from principle. Principle is a moral stand in which is like a platform in which if we move from the platform, things collapse, okay? Those platforms, those pillars, there are certain principles that are unmovable for the human beings and for the human morality, okay? So, I want to ask you a question. Is vegetarianism a principle? Okay, not, not, not answered yet, okay? That's good, sometimes when you don't, you're not sure of the answer or if you're thinking, you know what they say about Spaniards, you know, they throw tricky questions. <laughs> um, all right, I'll go a bit further. What is a policy? Okay, a policy is the relevant application of a principle that takes into consideration the context in which is outlined. In other words, a policy or application of a principle need to be flexible in nature and might need changes changing in order to adapt itself to a new context, thus fulfilling the principle behind it. Okay, so you have the principle, whatever a principle is, and then you have the policies or applications. Let me illustrate. Uh, a gentleman that I knew uh, came from Australia to the United States of America, uh, responding to an offer to become a principal at a school. 
when he started in the first week, he had a group of young youngsters coming to his office. And they wanted to find out why they were not allowed to use blue jeans in the, in the school. So the principal said, um, I don't know. So he went out to the secretary and said, um, uh, sorry, I've got a group of young people here. They're asking me why they're not allowed to use blue jeans. And they said, it's policy. I said, oh, okay, all right. So he walks inside and said, well, look, I'm just new here. I just found out it's actually policy that you don't, you're not allowed to wear blue jeans. And said, yeah, but uh, principal, in the campus, we are actually allowed black jeans, green jeans, red jeans, purple jeans, any other jeans, not blue jeans. Oh, so he goes outside, he goes to the secretary, and he said, are they allowed black jeans? Oh yeah, black, black, black jeans are allowed. Okay, and what about red? He said, yeah, red jeans are allowed. And blue? No, no, no blue jeans, that's, for, that's policy. He said, ah, oh. okay. He went and asked who was the oldest employee in that school. He went to that employee and said, ever since I've been here, no blue jeans. Yeah, but what about the black jeans and the red? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Look at those over there. Nobody's going to tell them anything. But what about the blue jeans? It's policy. Yeah, okay. Is anybody that can actually explain to me this? He said, well, there is an old lady. She was involved in the first committee of the school many, many years ago. She still lives. So, and she lives in town, so you go and visit her. And maybe she will have an answer. So he was so curious, he went to actually visit this lady. And uh, she was there in the porch, uh, and, you know, sitting down, and he goes there and he introduced himself and the new principal of the school and so on. I just found out about the policy of the blue jeans. Can you tell me about it? And they said, oh, yes, yes. Um, I remember that. That was very early on, as I think after the first semester of the school being in operation. And we actually put that into a policy, yes. I said, why? I said, well, because we had all new furniture, all new chairs, and the chairs were made out of um, um, timber, uh, out of wood, sorry, made out of wood. Uh, so wooden chairs. And the blue jeans had these metal ribbons around them. I don't know if you remember those old, very, very old metal ribbons here. So as the students were sitting down and they were turning around and talking to each other, the metal ribbons were actually scratching the chairs. So because we paid so much money for the chairs and so on, we decided, okay, no blue jeans, because we just, they, you know, because the, 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 the ribbons are actually scratching the chairs. So he goes, but the chairs that we have in the school today, they're made out of plastic. And she goes, okay. And um, the blue jeans don't have those metal ribbons anymore. And she goes, yeah. So why is that policy still standing? And the old lady looks at him and said, I have no idea. <laughs> and she goes, what? why not the red jeans? Why not the black jeans? And said, oh, back then, they were only blue jeans. They were not red jeans, they were not black jeans, the only color was blue. So the policy applied in that time, and what was the principle that, that somehow gave birth to that policy? Let's go to protect the furniture. This is a, a local school with local investment from parents and so on. Let's go to protect the furniture. Is that a fair? Let's go to pr protect our school and our furniture. That's a fair thing. How are we going to do that? How are we going to put a policy and how are we going to put an application that fulfills the principle? Okay, make sure that you don't bring blue jeans. What should have happened? once the blue jeans stop having the ribbons and once they change the, t the, the chairs to plastic? What should have happened? They should have actually changed that policy. So that's why it says here that the policy needs to be flexible just in case it becomes irrelevant and it does not fulfill principle anymore. So the, the, 
the policy continuously has to keep on checking principle to remain relevant. Are you following? Okay, so I'll give you another example. This is in the 19th century. Girls should learn to harness and drive a horse and use the saw and the hammer as well as the rake and the hoe. They will be better fitted to meet the emergencies of life. Now, I've got two girls. I don't have a horse. Am I stuck because I don't have a horse? Now, is that a statement? Can you tell me uh, what is the principle behind that statement? It starts by saying that girls should know how to harness and drive a horse, how to use the saw and the hammer. What is the principle behind that? It's in the 19th century, in a time in which women were very much suppressed, very much dependent upon men. If men was the bringing the money in the house and men could actually use that as a power tool, where are you going to go? You got no education, you got no money, you stay here as my servant. Can you see that? So this female author says, you, you parents, you teach your girls how to drive a horse, how to make them independent, how to actually be able to not to depend on a man if need be. So that's in the 19th century. Am I fulfilling by teaching my daughter how to change the tires in the car? Am I fulfilling the same principle, yes or not? Yes. Absolutely. Um, the principle hasn't changed. Parents should actually make sure that your daughters know how to change the tire in the car, know, know how to uh, put uh, coolant in the, in the um, in the refrigerator, I was going to say, a radiator, and how to actually check for the oil and even top it up with oil, just to make sure that they have a breakdown or they have a flat tire at 11 o'clock at night and they are able to change it, okay, and get, get home safely. The principle remains, can you see it? The principle stands. What changes is the application with the time. So. Look at this one. This is Jesus with the, um, with the miracle of the fish and the, and the bread. And there's one that says, um, has that fish been tested for mercury? <laughs> Another one says, I can't eat that, I'm a vegan. And the other one says, is that bread gluten free? <laughs> and of course, uh, you know that we've got the gluten connection. Now, if vegetarianism was an unmovable principle. And if you are a Christian and a vegetarian and believe that vegetarianism is an unmovable principle, then Jesus had to be a what? A vegetarian. Because you cannot get the one that did not commit any sin move away from principle. Then you have to have holy people in the scriptures like Moses or Paul or Peter, or many others, all vegetarians. Why? Because you don't move from principle. So, is vegetarianism a principle or an application based on the circumstances that are around us? What is it? It's an application. Now, to understand that brings a lot of freedom. It brings a lot of freedom because there's many people that I know in the vegetarian world that come to see me in the clinic. They are sick as a dog, but they have a con a, 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 an understanding that they are vegetarians by principle, or they are vegans by principle, or they are fructarians by principle, and you don't move from principle, and if you need a supplement or if you need something else that is going to help you, that is outside of what you perceive to be principle, you're not going to take it. I had people said to me, I am going to just do what is right and let God, uh, let, let God with the consequences. Now, 
How many here think that what God wants of you is to make you sick? So the consequences cannot be that you are sicker and sicker and sicker. Now, another thing is when you do what is right and don't worry about what everybody else is saying, okay? And that's, the, that's a different story. If you do what is right, no matter what, don't, don't, don't follow peer pressure. But you cannot play that game of I'm going to do what is right despite the fact that by doing what is right, I am getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Are you following? So understanding that vegetarianism is a principle brings a lot of freedom in too many, in too, too many individuals. I was in, I've, I've been presenting these seminars in a number of, of ways. And as I said, many vegetarians that come to see me, they come to see me because I am a vegetarian. Okay? And I had a lady once that came and said, um, um, the first thing that she said, she walked through the door and she said, will you give me permission to eat eggs? And I said, oh, that's a very strange question. If I give you permission to eat eggs, I said, why is that? Why are you asking that? I said, I just need you to give me permission to eat eggs. Now, this is a person that can be my mother in age. And said, why are you saying that? I said, well, I haven't been eating eggs for about seven years. And I'm just wondering, and as she was talking, she was showing signs of demineralization in the teeth. The teeth were actually getting very gray, gray in color. I don't know if you've ever seen it. We have seen it quite a lot. And um, she said that she was, she was getting very, very, very sick. And about two years ago, or two years prior, she went to the shop, she bought very, very expensive eggs. You know, the ones that half a dozen for $10 or something like that, you know, like, man, it must have been laid by the, the, the hand of gold or something. Um, and she said that she boiled two eggs. She ate the two eggs. She felt amazing in the stomach. She actually regained some of the strength. And she spent a week on her knees asking for forgiveness. Hmm, there's something there, isn't it? There is bondage. That is called bondage. And, uh, and we have to make sure that we are not in bondage. I had, um, from a Christian church, I had a lady that came. She belonged to a group of uh, health, a health group. And that health group uh, had very strict guidelines very strict guidelines. And this lady came and said to me that uh, she, she, she was very desperate. Many, many times those people come to see me when they're very, very sick. I wish many of them would come two, two years earlier. Uh, and she was very, very desperate. And she said that a week before she came, she actually had an egg. And I said, and how do you feel? I said, oh, I felt good. I said, okay, what do you want to do? And she goes, I want to continue, can I? I said, all right. I, I, sh I share with this lady, you're showing signs of protein deficiency, you're showing signs of demineralization, you're showing signs of glutamine deficiency, you're showing signs of zinc deficiency, you're showing signs of omega-3 omega deficiencies. She, has, she was showing all, she was ticking, 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 ticking all the boxes. And she goes, look, I'm going to continue to do this. And then she goes, so you do presentations in local places and say, yeah, like for, for in uh, public places and universities and schools and so on. Do you do that in churches? I said, yeah, Christian churches. You know, I had, I've been presenting with my wife in Pentecostal churches and in Adventist churches in other churches. I said, okay, do you present in, and she mentioned the name of her church. And I said, I think I presented in that church. And she froze. She goes, do, do you know anybody in that church? I said, I don't know. Maybe if I see them, maybe the people that invited me. Oh, you, you need to promise me something. Everything that I said here is confidential. Is that right? I said, sure. Why? You, you're not going to mention to anybody that I, I just ate an egg, right? <laughs> I said, no, of course not. It's confidential. Do you know what was the amazing thing? 
she started regaining health. Uh, you know, I put her in a number of supplements uh, because, you know, to kick up her immune system and she started feeling better. So the others in the group, they started saying, well, you look better. Who are you seeing? I'm seeing such and such practitioner. So I started having half of the group there. Unknown to all the people in the group, everybody was consuming eggs secretly and everybody asked me as their confessor <laughs> please 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 do not say anything to anyone in the group and as of course as a as a, as a practitioner i i have to buy by that but i thought that's that's stray that's strange that is bondage there is no liberty there is actually bondage and when there is bondage you, you have a limited amount of the usage of your common sense because your common sense is restricted. Are you following? Okay. Now, I'm going to share with you, for instance, a number of things that might influence your decision of the type of application that you are going to do to fulfill your principle. We are going to discover what the principle is. So for instance, this is a Japanese dock almost 70 feet long that washes ashore in Oregon 50 months after the tragic earthquake and tsunami. So look at that size. That, the people that you see there, the people are here, right at the top. That thing is massive. He went from Japan all the way to Oregon, okay, 50 months later. Now, but the, radi the radioactive waters remain in Japan. They have no move from Japan. Is that right? No. Okay, so that thing goes from Japan to Oregon, but the radioactive waters in Japan, they, are, they haven't moved from Japan. They're just there. No. Okay, so for instance in here, there's 30 Pounds built to uh, 30 billion pounds built to purify water system after toxic impact of contraceptive pills in the river. This is in England. What does that mean? It means that everybody is on a contraceptive pill. They take it in the morning, and then they go to the toilet. They flush the toilet, and the water goes into the river. And when you have millions of women flushing the toilet at the same time, millions of them with a, with a uh, contraceptive pill, that level of hormones get into the waters. Who is in the water? The fish. Who can now not procreate? The fish. Because they are using contraceptive pills. <laughs> okay? So, that starts sort of unveiling a little bit of, hold on a second. I need to find out what the principle is in order to find out how I'm going to apply it. So, it gets worse because we can go on in some of the, f uh, of the animal farming techniques. But, as I said to you in the beginning, I'm going to hopefully make you uncomfortable in some of the things by me trying my best to be balanced. Now, these are my neighbor's onions a kilometer away. These are commercial onions. The other ones, the one on the right, those are my wife's onions. They were planted on the same day because he plants onions, we look through the window. When he plants the onions, we plant our onions. When he plants potatoes, we look through the window, we plant potatoes. Uh, I don't follow a calendar, I follow my neighbor. He does it commercially though, okay? So these are commercially uh, grown onions. They get sprite, hold on to your seats, in one way or another up to 30 times before harvest. So either through fertilizers or through herbicides or pesticides, up to 30 times. This one's here, not, not my wise ones. But even there, can you already see a difference? These photos were taken on the same day, so it's the same, you know, about 10 minutes apart. The color is different. The size is different. So now it's not just the fish, isn't it? 
we have to be aware of what is actually happening here. Now, those are another neighbor's garlic. These are not commercial. This is actually from another neighbor, and that's my wife's one. You see the difference? The same day also. Huge difference. Okay, because if it is not in the soil, it's not in the plant. If it's not in the plant, you're not eating it. So we have to be very, very careful to assume that the meat is contaminated, the fish is contaminated, but my salad is nice and healthy. We have to be very, very careful with that. Okay? Because I don't think that, that the process of the modern lifestyles that we're living in is just concentrated in one level of or type of food source. How many here have heard of, gra of do not eat the grass second hand? Have you heard that? Okay, because what do you feed the, the cows in the United States of America, for instance? Feeding lots. They use grain and corn. The majority of the corn is actually, is actually going to the cows in feeding lots. So 98% of the, of the beef in the United States of America is actually grass fed. So does that statement fit? Do not eat the grain secondhand? Yes. Now in Australia, 98% of the meat is actually grass fed, not grain fed. So is there a difference between an American beef or a Australian beef? Is there a difference there? Yeah. Is there a difference between a, a battery hen that is laying 24 hours and one that is in your neighbor's backyard and has access to free range of green grass and so on. Is there a difference in the quality of that egg? Yes. Absolutely. So what are we saying? Context gives us the, the, um, the, the way of compare and, and how are we going to um, apply it in our lives. Okay? Had a, had a, uh, a lady, uh, and this was in in one mm, country with lots of mountains. I have to be careful because she'll probably listen to this and I don't want to put her in trouble, uh, place her in trouble. But uh, she was going hiking with the husband and with another couple, okay? Both families were vegans, okay? Both families were vegans. That means no eggs, no milk, so on. So they went up to the mountain to do hiking in this country full of mountains and they were doing hiking. Right up on top of the mountain, uh, they stopped for lunch. And they were doing hiking for a number of days. Now, this couple had purchased from the United States of America an, uh, some gels. Some gels, you know, in a tube, that you, like, you squeeze them in and gives you all the vitamins, all the calories, all the fat, whatever you need, you know? So you squeeze them in. And then, of course, you are in the middle of the mountain. So what are you going to do with that plastic? You're going to carry it, OK? So they had quite a number of those cast, uh, um, hiking vegan tubes. So all of a sudden, they stopped by a river. And their couple, their, 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 the, the, the other couple, the friends, the vegans, they actually saw that there was fresh fish in that clean crystal water. And they went and fished the, the, the fish. I don't know if it was a trout or whatever. They took the trout out and they made a fire and they cooked it and they ate it. And the husband and, and of, of this lady and herself, they were looking at them thinking, what a hypocrites. You know, call themselves vegans, hypocrites. Now, when they finished their trout, all the reminder things, they were thrown into the fire. The bones and, and the skin and so on, it was thrown into the fire. Then both couples stood up and they started their journey back to their camp. And she says that at that point she realized that she was carrying so many kilos of made in USA in her bag made out of plastic and artificial 
compounds put together, all synthetic, all put together. And a thought came to her mind, who made this product versus who made the fish? And who is feeding who? And uh, she had like an epiphany uh, moment in that sense. Why? Because application can, it needs to be taken into account the circumstances. Okay? And just to finally illustrate that, one story that was shared with me by an old missionary, a gentleman that was in the mission field in, in islands, in the Pacific Islands in the 1960s. He and his missionary friends were, um, they, they had a, a very restricted vegetarian diet, very restricted. And they went to this island, and the way he was describing it, it was an island, I'm not going to say the name, but it was an island that was a very long island, but very, very thin. So you can cannot, you cannot almost walk from one, end to, of the, from one side of the island to the other in, in just a few minutes. So that's how thin it was, but it was long. Okay? So the natives there, their diet was chicken, was fish, and the eggs, and some of the produce, some of the, the starchy roots, vest, root vegetables and so on. So this group of people from Australia, they, they landed there and they brought all their wheat, their, uh, lots of wheat and flour, lots of uh, almonds and nuts and all sorts of things, all sorts of goodies. That area was extremely humid because it was in the tropics. So everything got moldy. Everything got moldy. And nevertheless, you know, they will just get rid of the mold, you know, and they will soak the almonds and peel them and things like that, and they make the almond milk and so on. And very, very soon, because they were the white men teaching, they actually taught everybody to get rid of the chickens. To, it, was, it became a little bit of a no-no to fish in the, in the land, in the fish, the fish in, that, in, that, in those waters, and so on. And then the man that was actually telling me the story started to cry. That was in the 1960s. And I don't forget, I will never forget that man because he, he was an old man now. And I was a youngster compared to him. And he started to cry and said, and I said, why are you crying? And said, we killed them all, Oscar, we killed them all. I said, what are you talking about? The children, Oscar, the children, we killed them all. He actually saw malnourished children be held and dying in the mother's arms. And he said, he said that story to me after I presented, is vegetarianism a principle or an application? They could not have the almonds there. They could not have the grains there. They actually imported bees to help with the pollination because you could not grow tomatoes, you could not grow zucchinis, you could not grow anything because the island was so thin that the breeze of the wind, uh, the, the breeze and the wind will actually remove the bees away and they could not find their way back to the beehive and it was useless. They brought a number of beehives just to encourage pollination. And so they did everything. They put set, setting, they, they did a lot of gardening with Australian mentality into a total different context. And he said to me, and now you come and you tell me about principle and application and you have brought all the ghosts back to my head. All the ghosts back to my head. We need to make sure where we are. So what is the principle behind vegetarianism? Preserve the best health. That is the principle. The principle is present the best health. That's why I am a vegetarian, because that will present my, the best of my health. But guess what? Somebody has said to me, Oscar, that's why I eat meat three times a week, because that is what it preserves my health. Are you following? Eat that food which is most nourishing. That is the principle and doing the very best possible under every, every immediate circumstance to promote life, health, 
and strength. That's the principle. Vegetarianism is the application. Are you getting this? Okay. Now, the same author that went to Australia wrote this. Those who have feeble digested organs can often use meat when they cannot eat vegetables, fruit, or porridge. Now, why would that lady say that? She was promoting vegetarianism. She's the one that, that I quoted before when she said we were all vegetarians, we all vegetarians, some only eating moderately and others abstaining totally. Why would she say that? Is she promoting vegetarianism? And is she being a hypocrite or is she just fulfilling principle? Those who have feeble digestive organs can often use meat when they cannot eat vegetables, fruit, or porridge. Why? Because if you cannot eat it, you're not going to fulfill your principle of being healthy. Do you know that quote? I actually appreciate very much the writings of this author. Sometimes there was more wisdom in the 19th century than in the 21st century. This was a life-saving quote for me. And not just for me. It's specifically for one of my patients. This patient, when she walked with mom into my office, she looked sick. She was around 40 kilos. She was extremely sick. In fact, she had been sick for more than three years. She was a lovely girl, lovely girl. She, she finished university and she went to work with one of the um, uh, organizations that help children in places like India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and so on. I mean, a young girl that can make money after a university degrees, degree anywhere and she decides to help. When she goes there, she gets contaminated water, she got bacteria infections, she got the lot. And her intestinal uh, permeability was severely compromised, extremely compromised. When she went back to Australia, she started having anaphylactic reaction to a number of items. Do you understand what an anaphylactic reaction is? Is when the body actually has a very quick response to whatever you're eating and you, your tongue starts getting thick and your, your, your breathing is impaired because of, of inflammation around the bronchioles and if you don't put an EpiPen very, very quickly in your leg, you might actually die. She was reacting to absolutely whatever you can imagine most probably she was reacting. If it wasn't anaphylactic, she was just having tremendous bloatiness, tremendous headache right after, after the eating. It was just amazing. By the time she came to see me, she was literally a fructarian. And, but it was not so much by choice, but rather by need. It was just the only thing that she could actually eat. And out of, out of the fruits, out of the fruits, we're talking about she could eat blueberries, she could eat kiwi, not much banana because it will constipate her, and a few other things. Grains, I'm talking about gluten-containing grains and non-gluten-containing grains. It was a huge, huge reaction. No, no. Reacting from nuts. That's another group. What's another group of a vegetarian diet? Legumes? She will eat legumes and it will be like she was seven months pregnant. She will be turning and turning with tremendous spasms and pain in the stomach. So we have the fruit, very, very limited, just, you know, four pieces of fruit. Don't give her watermelon in that condition because she will just go ballistic of, with pain. So even the fruit that she was eating, it was very, very limited. And then in the vegetable kingdom, she could not actually come near the brassica family, that goes your broccoli, your kale, your cauliflower, your cabbage, your Brussels sprouts, your Chinese cabbage, that goes out. Tremendous gas, tremendous bloatiness, tremendous liver pain. She could not have avocado because of the damage that had been created here. There's a release of um, uh, from the mucosal cells. There is actually a release of mucus and now the mucus is impairing the digestive enzymes to work and digest that fat. So, you know, tell her coconut oil is good for you. She will be bloated for two days with a tremendous headache in that situation. So, 
the nightshade family. Who is the night? What are the, in the nightshade family? The tomato, the capsicum, the eggplant, and the and the potato, as well as the goji berry. Out. So she could have carrots and berries. She could have zucchini and kiwi. She could have um, cucumber and a little bit of banana. How long can you sustain life in that situation, in that condition? Huh? Not much, isn't it? Not much. This quote, I used it with her. And I do not apologize to anybody. You know why? Because she's been, she was sick for three years. Do you think I was the first practitioner in three years that she visit? No. No. She wasn't the first, I wasn't the first one. Okay? The recovery has been slow, but progressively. Now she's able to introduce new things now that the healing has been happening. The situation and the context teaches us what is the application so we can fulfill principle. Are you following? That's why I'm saying that this was the most important presentation of the three that you're going to hear in these seminars. If we understand this, there is tremendous freedom in the individual. That you're regaining your freedom of conscience, which is given as a gift to each individual, okay? We don't have a, a group conscience, we have an individual conscience. And because I'm a Christian, I will say an individual conscience before God, okay? So, after we have actually set the basis on this, we are going to move to the second presentation and we are going to uh, identify the, micro, the macronutrients that are needed for healthy functioning of our bodies and how to do it from, uh, from vegetarian sources or else if things are not working well with those sources. You ready for it? Okay. How many of you have already been challenged with the first presentation? Some of you. Good. And I'm pretty sure in the house, the people in the house probably either they have been challenged or they want to get my email address and they are going to start sending live threats <laughs> to that account. So I won't say my email address uh, publicly, but you can contact us through our website because we do have a very good filter uh, through that. Okay, I encourage you to continue in this uh, vegetarian and nutrient connection. Thank you for your attention.